our Bibles to Titus. We're in chapter 2. Tonight we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 as we continue our series through the book of Titus. We'll begin by looking at verse 1. I'll give you a review of some of the things we saw in the verses just prior to verse 1 here in chapter 2. And then we'll get into our study. So reading verse 1, Titus chapter 2. Paul says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, Paul has just written concerning the false teachers who have been infiltrating the churches of Crete. We saw last time we were together that they are Jewish legalists, and what they've been doing is they've been bringing in what are referred to as the commandments of men. Notice that in chapter 1, verse 14, when he said, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Of men. So these are Jews who apparently are professing to be Christians, but they're bringing Jewish traditions into the church. Now, Jesus spoke concerning this kind of thing in Matthew 15, verse 9. He had said, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so these are people who are infiltrating, bringing in doctrines that are not inspired by God, commanded by God in His Word. And so they're what are called infiltrators. And Paul speaks of them, and and he's uh, described them. He speaks of them as being insubordinate. The word insubordinate simply means rebellious because they don't submit to God's word, his spirit, or those who are leading the church. He referred to them as idle talkers. An idle talker is somebody who's a smooth talker. They're the ones who, who lie but seem to be speaking truth. These idle talkers are the ones who take Scripture out of context, and they can eloquently and convincingly teach error. It's like what Peter in 2 Peter 2 verse 18 said when speaking of these. He said, they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. So they take the Scripture, whatever Scripture they may be speaking of or referring to, They take it out of context, but they do so in an eloquent way, and they convince people. And in fact, they're not teaching the truth at all, but they're teaching error. That's why they're called deceivers. A deceiver uses biblical terminology, but is, again, misusing Scripture. And somebody said the sad fact about a deceiver is this. They never seem to lack an audience. There will always be those who will listen to what they have to say. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the command was given, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And he goes on to say, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And I have to tell you, we're living in that season now where people are heaping into themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Now, these false teachers were not to be ignored. They have to be dealt with. They have to be dealt with swiftly. Why is that? Well, it's because they are subverting entire families. What they're doing with their doctrine is dividing families. Families are beginning to argue over the things of the Lord, and it's bringing confusion into the homes. They're also undermining the faith of naive and innocent believers. As a matter of fact, they're so terrible that they're even charging people to hear their error. It says in verse 11, their mouths must be stopped who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So they're making merchandise of the people. They're, They're charging people for their error. I see that every once in a while without going into any names, not necessary at the moment. But uh, I see that every once in a while where you may turn on a program that is called a Christian program and has some exciting, they're usually exciting young guys. Old guys aren't too exciting anymore. They're just trying to keep from falling asleep. But the young guys, the young guys are real busy. They're real energetic. And they, they, I just, my, my daughter-in-law just sent me a, a video of one particular uh, teacher of that stripe. And, and she said, this is what... This is what causes people who are not believers, this is what causes them to be turned off to Jesus. And so I put on this very popular teacher for a moment, and I saw what he was doing, and 
And he was up there screaming and yelling, and he had the organ playing behind him, and it was all exciting. But as you listen to what he had to say, he wasn't saying anything. And that's basically what happens is they begin to, to give this, this uh, not, uh, untrue teaching. But these people who are, are uh, coming into the church, what they're doing is they're even charging people for what they're saying. And, and, uh, and that, that is so wrong. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 17 uh, spoke concerning an accusation that had been made about him. Um, false teachers who had entered into the church at Corinth was, were trying to undermine his ministry authority, and they actually charged him with being a person who is uh, charging people and changing the doctrine of, of Christ. And he said in 2 Corinthians 2.17, we are not like the many who market God's message for profit. On the contrary, he said, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. And so if a true teacher speaks with sincerity before Christ for the sake of the Lord, but the false teachers are doing it for the sake of dishonest gain. And what they're doing is they're preaching commandments of men and they're leading people from the truth of the gospel. They're leading them away. They're telling Christians to follow the law of Moses, including, it would appear, even the right of circumcision. In Galatians, Paul spoke with the same kind of uh, false teachers, and he spoke of them in chapter 5, verse 6, and he said, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And so they're bringing in legalism and all, and what they're doing is they're, they're undermining the gospel. These false teachers, as we saw last time, are, are defiled. They're unbelieving in both mind and conscience. He had closed by saying they profess to know God, but in works they deny him. And he said they're abominable. That word abominable means detestable. They're detestable to God. He said they're disobedient and they're disqualified for every good work. So these are strong words, but they were necessary to be spoken. Why is that? Because Paul had a great concern because the gospel message is to be guarded. He said the same kind of thing when he was uh, writing to his other son in the faith, uh, a young man named Timothy. He had said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verse 14, he had said to Timothy, a young pastor of the church in Ephesus, he said, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guard it, keep it, protect it. So Paul wrote with great concern because he knew the importance of the gospel message as a message that God gave men for salvation and blessing, it has to be safeguarded. That's why he said of himself in Philippians 1.17, I am set for the defense of the gospel. I have been strategically placed in the position of safeguarding the message of Christ. And because he was, he had great concern that Titus would also safeguard its message. And so that's what we've seen as we've come up to chapter 2. And so when we get into chapter 2, verse 1, he says it like this. He says, but as for you, in contrast to the false teachers, as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. In contrast to these false teachers, your life and your teaching needs to be obviously different. By habit, you are to constantly speak that which is consistent with sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? It's healthy teaching. You see, there is a, a, what is called a body of beliefs. There's a body of beliefs that make up or constitute what is called Christian orthodoxy. I'm going to give you a few things about that. Uh, when, you, when, you, when I speak of Christian orthodoxy, I'm speaking of, of, of uh, teachings that have been inspired by God, given to us by the Holy Spirit in the Word of God, that cause us to understand what truth actually is. And the things that we, the church, have held to from its beginning are very basic. Let me share some of them with you. These basic beliefs relate to the inspiration of Scripture, the revelation of God and His attributes, the deity of Jesus Christ, Jesus' virgin birth, the purpose of the atonement, the person of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of hell, doctrine of man, sin, salvation, the last days, the second coming of Christ, 
angels. These are all what constitute Christian orthodoxy, and you can do studies on this. There are books that are written, uh, whole libraries of books that are written related to these things, and, and all of these particular things, this body of beliefs, are, are found in Scripture, but they have also been attacked throughout the church's history. And so these attacks on these basic things began very early. So Paul is exhorting Titus to, to be faithful to Scripture. And that's why in verse 1 he says, Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. That word sound speaks of that which is uncorrupted or healthy. Paul uses that word sound, by the way, five different times in this letter. He desires Titus to teach an uncorrupted message that builds godly disciples. You see, for some, gathering a group of people is more important than producing solid believers. And because the gospel is so radical, its claims can cause people to become convicted. And because that's true, some may water down its contents in order that they may gain listeners. I've been reading that recently in different posts that I read on, on social media and all, and there, there are uh, Christians who are sounding the alarm, and they're saying, we're living in a day when healthy doctrine is being undermined by, by, um, by weak, I'll be honest with you, weak pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers who aren't willing to tell the truth because they're afraid to empty their pews. We were taught a long time ago that we ought to be willing to empty the church in order to fill it. You know, there are a lot of churches that are filled with empty people. They may have a lot of people in the seats, but those people in the seats are not being filled with the things of God. And so, because some pastors have realized that, and some have come to understand that people don't like to be convicted. By the way, who does? Who likes to be convicted? I do. I just love it. No, who likes to be convicted? <laughs> Nobody. Not really. But when you go through the whole counsel of God, you're going to see the blessings as well as take the buffetings. There's going to be what God says is, is you're doing well, and then other things, when you hear it or read it, you're going to say, that is not me. That isn't what I'm doing. And so we need the whole counsel of God. And so because some know that, that it causes people discomfort to hear, they'll avoid those kinds of things because they want to gain listeners. You see, Paul knew that God's word cuts to the heart. And he knew like a surgeon's scalpel, it will remove what is unpleasing. And that's what the word of God does. It, it removes that which is actually, actually going to kill you. You've gone through operations. Many of us in this room probably have. We've gone through operations, you know. I've had things removed from me that if you'd asked me, do you want, to, do you want that removed? You know, are you asking me, do I want someone to slice into my belly, pull out my appendix? Are you asking if I'd like to spend an afternoon and then a few, few, uh, few days recovering? Do you think I'd like to do that? No. No, I wouldn't. I had uh, cancer in the, in the bladder a few years ago. Uh, would you like to go and uh, go under and have them, you know, remove this this tumor from your from your bladder? Would you like to do that? No, but you know what? I like living more, and so the discomfort is fine for a moment. I discovered a long time ago that uh, God's word has a way as a surgeon's scalpel of removing those things that are not pleasing to Him that ultimately could even grow to the point of. Of, of causing a serious harm in our lives. So the Word of God is intended to do that. It's a, it's a surgeon's scalpel that removes certain things that, that ought not to be there. And, and Paul knew that God's Word would cut to the heart, but it would re remove that which doesn't please the Lord. You see, when it goes forth, it, uh, it often exposes the heart for what it truly harbors and, and what its desires really are. And, and sometimes, let's face it, when we're convicted, we become uncomfortable. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29 the question is asked, is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And indeed it does. So because of this, some won't teach the whole council for fear of boring or alienating listeners. Others will alter it to suit their own purposes and beliefs in order to have personal gain, maybe some prestige, maybe some wealth. But as a true minister of the word, Titus is to teach sound doctrine consistently why, again, it's because healthy doctrine produces healthy sheep. And that's what shepherds are commanded to do. So he says in verse 1, speak, and that word speak is in a Greek tense that means consistently, by practice, habitually, 
Speak consistently the things which are proper for sound doctrine. When he says speak the things, that word speak refers not only to the way he speaks, but what he's communicating through his preaching and teaching. And these things are, are proper. The word proper speaks of that which is suitable. It's fitting for healthy teaching. And when he speaks of sound doctrine, it's healthy and suitable teaching. It's uncorrupted by anything. So what he's to do is he, he's to live the message and he's to give that message. And the result will be that people who see the gospel lived out will also hear it as it's spoken. And so as he's speaking about this, in contrast to the false teachers, he now goes into some practical instruction for, uh, for the members of the church. He divides it into a few categories. We'll look at them, beginning at verse 2. He says, uh, what is the purpose of sound doctrine? Well, verse 2, that the older men would be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Mm. So he's writing to me. What is the result of being taught the word of God and living it out? The result will be a well-lived life. This word is to impact the older men, the older women, the young married women, the young men as well as servants. And so Titus is to do his best to see that older men are taught certain things. What are we to be taught? Well, Titus, you need to teach the older men to be sober. Now, an older man is someone who was, at that time, who was over 60 years of age. And so you're to teach them certain characteristics, certain moral characteristics. Okay, if I have any 60-year-old in here, we're having a conversation right now. 60-year-old men. You're to be sober. What does that mean? Well, the obvious is abstaining from wine, either entirely or at least from what it's been called immoderate use. You're to be moderate in your way of life, in your taste, in your habit. You're supposed to be, he says, sober in attitude. You're to be disciplined in how you speak and disciplined in what you do. In other words, older men are supposed to act their age. It wasn't that long ago. I don't know if it's still true. We used to, this was kind of like a comical stereotype. But there was a time, um, as I look out here, most of you won't remember this time. Let me give you a history lesson. There was a time when guys were going through what was referred to as a midlife crisis. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's called male menopause. Does it exist? <laughs> Absolutely, we just don't get hot flashes. We just want hot, hot cars. And so, and so they were the guys in the 70s that people would kind of point out. And being, I was a young man in the 70s. I was one who would notice this. They were, they were the ones who wore these leisure suits. You wouldn't know what that is. Some of you might. With the big old wide collars. They had big old wide collars, usually real paisley, and big old wide bow bottoms and platforms and and they would wear their comb overs because they wanted to look cool. And, and they had gold chains, you know, sometimes several of them. And, uh, and you would look at them and you would say, this is sad. Th these, these, these guys don't realize how goofy they look, you know. And so an older man is supposed to age with dignity. And, and, and when you're trying to compete with the, the younger guys, when you... When you try to pretend you're still all cool and everything, you're not. So stop it. <laughs> Just get old. Just crawl into a corner, wither away, and die. Come on. In Proverbs 16:31, it says, Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained by living a godly life. And so instead of trying, older man, instead of trying to compete with the young, glory in your age. Because you have life experiences. You have things you can share with younger men. And it's important to understand that. It's important to realize that if your life has been lived for years for Christ, that you have so much to add to the young man. Because young men, especially today, I can say this with confidence, are looking for 
models of some sort because many of the young men were raised without dads. And so in this church, I have had a number of men, young men over the years, who actually will, will say to me, I didn't have a dad. They'll tell me that. I didn't have a father. And they'll say, you have become a father to me. And I take that with, uh, with humility. I, I actually, I want to be someone like that. I want to be an example to the young men. I, I, I've sp I, I spoke to a young man recently who came from a, a home that uh, sadly broke up, and, and he doesn't have a model. He doesn't have a model for, for marriage because uh, the model he had didn't seem to work. And I was speaking to him a while back. He and I were having a conversation, a young guy, and I said to him, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to offer myself to you as a model, somebody who has served the Lord and has a good, a, a good marriage. I realized that what you had as you grew up may have not met the bill, but I want to be that for you. And I think that older men ought to do that. I think that older men ought to see ourselves as inheriting a role of being an example to young men. And so that's what Titus is being told. Act your age and teach the older men to act theirs. He also speaks of being reverent. That word reverent, you know, sometimes people will use the word reverent and, and may think of it as being kind of a stuffy thing. What it, it speaks of is a dignified way of life. It, it speaks about a man who is serious and respectable. It, it's a, one who has a godly way of life. He's the guy that you could seek spiritual advice from. Uh, these, these are men who live honorably, who are sensible and mature spiritually. So be reverent. He said, teach them to be dignified. A third thing he says, to be temperate. The word temperate speaks of being self-controlled. Uh, it speaks of exercising mature judgment, moral restraint. It speaks of being sensible these, the older men are not to make snap judgments, and they're not to lose control of their emotions. There's hardly anything that is more, un, just, it makes me uncomfortable. Hardly anything can make me as uncomfortable as when I see an older man getting really angry. You know, I, it just makes me uncomfortable, you know, and, and, and I've seen it. I, I've seen, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, an older man like he's 40 or 50. I'm talking about 60 or 70-year-old man who still thinks he can mix, mix it up. And, and, and I'm thinking, if that guy pops you, you're going to fold in half. <laughs> and, and I could go on with that. I won't. But <laughs> see, what happens as you grow older is you begin to realize that your life is coming to its end. And, and, and that's the kind of knowledge, by the way, that, that you ought to live with. Uh, in Psalm 90, verse 12, the, the psalmist said, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In Psalm 39, verse 4, uh, it, it reads, O oh Lord, help me, help me to understand my mortality and the brevity of life. Let me realize how quickly my life will pass. Help me to know that. Uh, when you're young, it feels like everything takes so long. It really does. You know, when you were a kid, oh, I can hardly wait until I'm, you know, 13. I can hardly wait until I'm 16. I can hardly wait till I'm 18. I can hardly wait till I'm 21. And then about then, you start saying, oh. you don't say, I can hardly wait till I'm 30. And so as you go older, you begin to realize that, that, the things that you used to want, the things you could hardly wait for, well, they're, those things are past now, many years sometimes. And as you grow older, you begin to realize that the road ahead is much shorter than the road behind. And you realize that so many of the things that you thought were so important that you just had to have, you had to have it right now, those are things that never really mattered. At the end, they never really mattered. It's not that it wasn't nice to achieve them, and it isn't wrong for you to have a goal to have something. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that very often when you've achieved the certain goals that you thought would produce kind of a joy and a happiness, you discovered that those things were short-lived. And then you, you got the car or you got the whatever, and, 
And yeah, it was fun when you first got it and, and started driving it. We'll say it's a car. And, and then you go to the, the store and somebody swings their car door open and hits your car. And before you know it, your, your God has been bruised and you're so upset. And then you, after, after a while, you realize these things all perish with the using. Why, why was I so caught up with this stuff? Why did I think it mattered? Because sometimes we worked so hard to gain these things that we worked a lot of overtime, never spent any time with the kids, and now the kids have grown up and they don't have any time for us. And you think that's not possible? It is absolutely true, and there are many older people who can tell you that. They can say, I saved up and wanted to have so many things, but I never had a chance to give them to my kids because I neglected them so much they don't want to be with me now. There are many people like that. So we need to have the wisdom to be aware that we're growing older and therefore we should have values that matter. In verse 2, he continues and says, sound in faith. When he speaks of being sound in faith, that refers to an understanding of the word of God, of doctrine. The sound in faith speaks of having a, a, an understanding of the word of God that is unmixed with error. You're not lukewarm. You're solid biblically. You know your doctrine. That's a person who spends a lot of time in the Word and is taught the Word. And again, Titus' responsibility was to teach them the Word. It's been said that their bodies may get tired and frail, but their faith will be strong and vital. It's like what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He said, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God, keep His commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. He had everything all through the book of Ecclesiastes. He tells you all the things he had gained, all the things that he did. But at the very end, he said the, the, whole, the whole thing just is wrapped up in fearing God and keeping his word. He goes on and he speaks about them learning to love. Um, they're going to have a godly love, not just emotional sentimentality. They're going to have a godly love. Teach them the word of God that they may know what love is, that they may have a well-grounded biblical understanding of it. Loving God, loving others, living a, a practical Christian life. As, as an older man, uh, we ought to have the desire to have people approach us as older men and say to us, you know, there's something about you that I appreciate, and that is the fact that you have such a deep love for God and other people. What a great testimony that would be for somebody to walk up to you if you're an older person and say, I just want you to know that the way you are, your heart, is something I want for myself. And I told that kind of thing to my pastor, Chuck Smith, that, that I told him, I said, when I grow up, I want to be like you. Because he had those qualities. And, and that's what, what Titus is speaking about here. And, and then he says, patience. Uh, patience is being non-reactive. Not, not a cranky old man who gets mad easy. Not thin-skinned. You know, it's, it's difficult to be around irritable old people, isn't it? Some of you say, well, I'm not that old. <laughs> well, it, it, it speaks about somebody who goes through a trial and doesn't throw their hands up and begin getting upset over it. It's somebody who's learned that it all works out. I've tried to share this with you before. I've said it before. It's true. Somebody has asked me, uh, what is the number one lesson you think you've learned over your life? And as a Christian, and it's this, it all works out in the end. It all works out in the end. You may not think so at the moment when things are happening and it's like the waves are filled in the boat. You may not think so, but it always has ended up right because God's in control. All things work together for the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. It's true. It's, it's true. And so just hold on. You know, help is coming. It's on the way. Now, let's talk about the old bags. <laughs> That's the literal Greek. <laughs> Older women. Older women, likewise. That they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. We'll start there in verse 3. He said they're to be reverent, in behavior. They're to conduct themselves properly as servants in God's temple, if you will. Their way of life is to be lived with gentleness, 
with grace, with dignity. Um, I put this in my notes. I might as well read it. If there's something that is sad to, to me, and it has been for a long time, this is nothing new. When he speaks of being reverent in behavior, conducting yourself properly, having gracious dignity, it, one of the things that is sad is to see older women trying to be sexy. What else can I say? And I've seen, if, I've seen that. I, you know, when I see it, I want to take my glasses off. I just don't, <laughs> I just, I just don't want to see it. I, I could go on, and I really, I have to be very careful because it's one of those things that really bothers me, you know. Um, don't. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> cougars. That's all I got to say. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. That's not good. Um, beauty is, is fleeting. Somebody once said in one of my classes when I went to college many years ago now, they said, there is hardly anything sadder than to see a beautiful woman growing older. I thought that was interesting because there's a certain amount of truth to that because when the young woman, when the woman was young and beautiful, uh, and Amer uh, Americans, I think the world probably, um, has a tendency of treating the beautiful differently than they treat the average or the homely. That's just the way it is. We know that. That's just a fact. Americans have a tendency of giving more attention to that which they find most attractive. That's true. And sometimes it's easy. It can be easy to learn that you can get your way with a certain way that you act, kind of cute, flirtatious, batting your eye, whatever. And when you're young, you know, sometimes you can get away with that. Guys don't want to come down hard, and so bosses may be a little bit in high. But uh, as you grow older, you, you can't rely on that anymore because it, it crosses a line from being kind of cute, but you ought to grow up, to that's very scary. You know, there was a movie a long time ago called Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I don't know if anybody ever saw it, but it was about a young girl who was called Baby Jane who got older, and she never understood that she wasn't Baby Jane anymore. And it's a tragic, a tragic movie. But I've told Marie before, I said, that girl reminds me of Baby Jane. And that simply means that they didn't grow with dignity. And so he says the word of God is to help the women to have the older women to understand who they are, that it never was their outer beauty. It was always the inner beauty that is attractive. It always has been. And uh, I, I'm going to say something that, that will possibly be misunderstood. But here we go. Um, you know, as a young man, you know, I noticed women and I would be attracted to women of a certain look. It, it just was, you know, everybody has that look that they're attracted to. I had it. And then one day I met my wife-to-be, Marie. And I say this with, with, with no disrespect. She knows this already. But what attracted me to this young woman wasn't her smile. It wasn't that I thought she was pretty. It was her heart. And what has kept me all of these years, true story, truth, has been that. It's been the beauty of her heart. It was that meek spirit. It was that, that genuine innocence. It was that kindness. It was all of those things. And I fell in love with the person before I realized that my wife has a beauty. I never, I never was going after the outer beauty. What God gave to me was a love for her as a person. And I really, I don't know how to say this any differently than that. When, when women don't understand the value they have in the Lord, they try to get their value in other ways. But when you understand who you are in Jesus Christ and what a beautiful heart you have, and how attractive you are to those with godly hearts. 
then you have a freedom. But if you're caught up always trying to be that beauty queen that you may have been 50 years ago, it's just sad. It's just sad. And so Titus, teach the women, teach the older women to be reverent in their behavior, to be gentle, to have a gracious dignity about them. He goes on to say, and not slanderers. A slanderer is someone who is a gossip, somebody who accuses people falsely. Like it says in Proverbs 26, verse 20, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. So teach them not to be gossips. He says, Third, not given to much wine. Don't be enslaved to drinking. Now, I was reading this, how that the older people on Crete would turn to wine to ease their pain, their discomfort, their sorrow, or even their loneliness. So he's saying older women are to be taught to trust in the Lord and his promises and not to be given to drinking. He goes on in verse 3, he says, teachers of good things. Through their knowledge of the Lord and their life experiences, they are the ones who should be counseling other women. Here in this fellowship, when, when women have a need for, for counsel, we have women who counsel other women. And that's what they're supposed to do, and that's what, that's what uh, Titus is being instructed in. And notice what they do in verse 4. It says that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good. What's that say? Oh, obedient. Oh, my goodness. Obe <laughs> Obe obedient to their own husbands. Look, honey, did you ever see that? Obedient <laughs> to their own husbands <laughs> that the word of God may not be blasphemed. <laughs> now, this is interesting. Notice how he says in verse 4 that they admonish the young women to love their husbands and love their children. Paul speaks of them ministering to the younger women. They're, they're to, to uh, train them how to love their husbands, how to love their husbands. I want you to see that. He says to love women to love their husbands, the women, young women to love their husbands and to love their children. This is, uh, this is an instruction in, of how they can do that. And uh, it, the experience the older women have in their marriage is, is what's going to help them to help the younger women to have patience in their own. And how to love their children is just another way of mamas helping other moms. You know, that's how it works. Um, yeah, the older women can, can be there and, and offer advice to the younger women when they want to hear it to help them to understand all kinds of things as it pertains to raising their kids and caring for the kids and all of that. And that's what the older women can do. He says in verse 5, to be discreet. When he says discreet, that means that you're careful in what you say or what you do. It speaks of proper behavior, to teach them proper behavior. He speaks of chaste. The word chaste speaks of purity, a purity of thought, of deed, even the way that they dress, to train them not to draw attention to themselves in any way that dishonors the Lord. Oh, it, it, again, you know, I, I believe that uh, we're living in a time when, when men dress immodestly, and sometimes they, they do. And so I don't want to make it seem as if only women can, but in context, he's speaking to the younger women. Um, but it's something to be wise about, young ladies. Uh, when my daughters were young, they really had this mistaken belief that boys were actually girls uh, who could grow beards. I mean, they, they didn't think there was a difference between a man and a woman. And I, it was tough, man. Because my girls, we'd say, are you kidding me? You know, no, Dad, they're, they're, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is men and women are not the same. We don't think the same. And I might have said this recently. I think I did. Forgive me for repeating myself. But if a woman came walking in right now wearing a, a bathing suit, you know, I guarantee the men and the women would think two different things. The guys would be saying, oh, my. And the women would say, well, that, 
that bathing suit, it kind of clashes with her hair. We don't, we don't think the same way. You know, we, we have, and so for me to teach my, my daughters that was, was, it was quite a task because they really didn't see the difference that men are stimulated visually. I mean, all the way back in the, in the beginning when, when Eve was brought to Adam, when he saw her, he made a comment about her. You know, he actually burst into song. I've taught that to you before in the book of Genesis. He actually sings this as woman. And, and he, he concludes his, his, uh, the job of naming, but he sang a song. It's a, it's a love song to her. She is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she has been brought out of man. That's actually a song. And so he sang when he saw her. And there's something about when a man sees a woman, and the women don't seem sometimes to understand that. And so they, they have to be wise about that. Um, what is it? I was going to tell you something. What is it called? Um, three things don't lie. Little children a drunk, and yoga pants. And so you have... <laughs> so <laughs> be aware of that. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. I think it's funny. Okay, here's another one. Uh, let's see. Older men should not go without shirts because they scare younger, younger children and confuse nursing babies. Okay, so. <laughs> it's here in my notes, right? Anyway, do not get caught up. Do not get caught up with extreme forms of fashion, drawing attention to yourself. Again, modern society has elevated fashion to a point of idolatry. It seems to me sometimes that, that uh, modern designers seem to hate women. They actually create some things that are so terrible, and, and, and they can encourage women to dress immodestly. And often clothing seems to either flaunt wealth, glorify self, or induce lust. So be aware of those things. A fifth thing, to be homemakers. To be a homemaker is the one who takes care of the needs of a home. It speaks of ministry. It speaks of ministry to husband and to, to children. And so the older women can teach the younger women how to be somebody who knows how to love and care for a family. And that's where she gets that example to, to actually uh, um, train up her children because when that young woman is being taught how to love, it helps the children to see love in action. It, it helps them to see proper submission and, and service as that wife has been trained in the things of the Lord to be one who cares for her family. It also protects her from improper or immoral relationship with other men. He goes on and he says in verse 5, they, to be good. That speaks of a, a kindness. It speaks of moral excellence. And kindness is shown in gentleness, in consideration, and in service to other people. Teach them to be kind. Now, here's that word, obedient, obedient to their own husbands. Now, though they are just as saved as their husbands, it gives them no excuse to resist his authority. In Colossians 3.18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Teach them what it means to listen in a voluntary subject subjection, because the house will run smoother as she does. Now, husbands are to love the wife. And we're not to lord it over her. And it makes it a lot easier for the wife to love and to have this word obedience, which is a submission to a proper authority. It makes it much easier when you're loving your, your wife. And then he goes on and he says, verse 5, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. When all of this has taken place, your lives ultimately bring glory to God and don't lead to slanderous remarks about the ineffectiveness of the Christian life. He goes on in verse 6 and he says, Likewise, exhort young men to be sober-minded. 
So what they're to do is they are younger men. Place yourself under the authority of the word of God. Live a self-controlled life because that results in the glorifying of Jesus Christ. When I was 23, 23, I gave my first Bible study. My first Bible study class, if you will, home Bible study, was to my father and my mom and to a woman named Claudette who lived down the street who was close to my parents' age and another couple who were around my parents' age. And there I am at the age of 23 teaching older than me people um, as well as my sisters. How does a young man teach his father? How does a young man open the book and instruct his own father and adults, people who were twice my age? How do you do that? You do it by earning their respect. You do it by living out what you're giving out. And so a long time ago, the Lord taught me, you know, back in 1973, the Lord began to teach me back then to live out the message because respect for the teacher can very often equate in respect for the word. But when the teacher of the word is not living out what he's giving out, it undermines the effectiveness of the Bible study. And that's why he's telling him in verse 7, Show yourself to be a pattern of good works. Model a godly life. Because this is visible encouragement of how the Lord works in someone's life and blesses. It's like what Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 9 when he said, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So live these things out. And God will bless you and others will see that. And so he says here in verse 7, he says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, show integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. In doctrine, show integrity. Be honest to the word. Do not compromise it for the hearer. In reverence, that speaks of dignity and seriousness. When he was writing to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, he said it like this. He said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. So there needs to be the seriousness. There needs to be this integrity. And there needs to be this incorruptibility. Uh, that simply says that you can't be bought. You can't be bought by money. You can't be bought by friendship. You can't be intimidated, and you can't be given influence. You need to just do it as unto the Lord, because at the end, it's from the Lord you hear the well done. If I have anybody in here who has a heart to teach the word of God, never forget that. You know, it, you, you have to be a person who knows that you'll give an answer to the Lord for the things that you said. And... Um, the one that God pays attention to is the one who trembles at his word. It's the one who respects it and, and wants to teach it properly. And he says, you need, to, you need to be this kind of person. You need to have integrity. You need to have reverence. And you need to be incorruptible. And the result is that nobody is going to rebuke you for an improper teaching. And finally, he goes on in verses 8 through 10. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So he says to exhort servants to be obedient and not answering back, etc. They're to live an honest life because they're working for an eternal reward. In Colossians 3, 22 through 24, it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Do it not only when their eyes on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, 
work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So you do it as unto the Lord. Everything you do should be done with sincerity as unto the Lord. You do it with all of your heart, and you don't do it just for men or to be seen by men, to be rewarded by men. That's what, that's what gives you integrity when you're on the job. When other people are deciding instead of a 15-minute break or a 10-minute break, they're going to take a 15 or 20-minute break or whatever. But you're going back to do the work. And I know that it can be pressure because guys have told me that before. But you're doing it as unto the Lord. The work that you're doing is unto Jesus. It's not to the boss who's watching you. It's to the one who's watching you. And so you do it with all your heart. You do it with all your strength. You do it as unto him. And you do it simply because that's what you do. That's what Christians do. And eventually what happens is people may notice that. And you do it as long as the Lord gives you strength to do it. And so at the end of the day, there's nothing like being able to put your head on a pillow and know that you were an honest worker that day. There's hardly anything that gives you more internal reward than the knowledge that that you put your hand to the plow and that you plowed that field and, and you're a workman worthy of your hire. And my dad taught me that. My dad taught me that. My dad taught me, to, if you're going to do something, son, do it with all your strength. Do it right. And, and, and don't, don't, don't always be making mistakes because you're lazy. My dad taught me these things. In the very first week that I had been placed on staff as an assisting pastor in the church I was ordained in, the very first week that I put in, I put in 70 hours. And it felt like it was just, it came and went each. I was so happy to be freed up to serve the Lord, to be able to work that for 70 hours. And I did a lot of, a lot of that for a long time. I still do that kind of thing to this day. Why? Because it says unto the Lord. You serve the Lord with all your strength. And Titus, that's what you need to do. So we'll close here and we'll pick up next time at verse 11.